Coaches, thanks for checking out the Coaches Locker Podcast with Chris Four. And really excited about episode 54. We interview the head football coach at Lincoln High School, Masaki Matsumoto. Coach is a great follow on Twitter. Follow him at Coach Matsumoto. That's C-O-A-C-H-M-A-T-S-U-M-O-T-O. Folks, we're going to cover his brilliant career, he how he started as a JV coach, and the very next year became a varsity coach, a varsity linebacker coach, in one of the best programs in Southern California, Cathedral Catholic. Then left and uh, turned a perennial loser uh, in the LA City section, a school you've never heard of, I guarantee you, Helen Bernstein, turned that school into a winner. And then left up to Lincoln High School, where he is now. Led those guys to the semifinals last year. I've titled this, So, You Really Want to Be a Head Coach. How One Coach's Love and Authenticity Has Turned Around and Built Successful Programs. We're going to talk about his journey. I saw a coach tweet out something uh, a little while ago. We're going to read that tweet to you. But it talks about all the difficult parts of being a head coach. I think a lot of guys want to be a head coach, but they don't necessarily... Uh, they haven't counted the cost. They don't understand all that goes into it. And so I, I thought it'd be great to bring him on and talk about, you know, being a head coach and all that goes into it. Coach Matsumoto grew up in Seattle, Washington and attended Kings high school. After graduating from high school, he received a scholarship to play football at Trinity International University in Chicago, Illinois, where he's a captain and all conference running back. He went on to receive his bachelor's degree in PE and health, and eventually a master's degree in special ed. Started his coaching career at Cathedral Catholic in San Diego back in 2006. Won a state title in seven, and then uh, in football, and then in track and field in 08. Then started his first teaching job at Bernstein High School in Los Angeles in 2008, where he also became an assistant football coach and a head track coach. After four seasons, I think they won eight games in four seasons, he said. He took over that struggling program and turned it around. In his three seasons as a head coach at Bernstein, his teams reached the playoffs in all three seasons, which is very, very impressive at that school. Made it to the semifinals, which is even more impressive. He was awarded the 2013 Central League Coach of the Year and 2013 LA Times Coach of the Year awards. In 2014, Bernstein was featured on ESPN E60, an episode with E60, for accomplishments on and off the field. He arrived at Lincoln High School in Tacoma, Washington on April of 2015 and just completed his fourth season with the Abes. He was awarded the Narrows League Coach of the Year in 2015 and the Pierce County League Coach of the Year in 16, 17, and 19. He was also a recipient of the National Football Foundation Paul Wolderuff Coach of the Year Award in 2017. He was the Seahawks Coach of the Week and NFL Coach of the Week in 19. His overall record as a head coach in eight seasons is 75 and 21 seven league titles in eight seasons boy that is so so stinking impressive when he's not teaching coaching he enjoys spending time with family and friends and we'll talk about the place he loves spending the most time oh yeah san diego ladies and gentlemen enjoy this great podcast with coach matsumoto you are listening to the Coach's Locker Podcast with Chris Ford, a place for all coaches to call home. The Coach's Locker Podcast is a part of the Football Coaching Podcast Network. Please visit footballcoachingpodcast.com to hear and see our entire lineup of top football coaches coming to you every single podcast with valuable information to help you and your program. The Coach's Locker Podcast with Chris Ford exists to help prepare coaches to be hired for the job of their dreams and to provide coaches with dynamite resources to become even more successful in their field. You can reach me on Twitter at, at Coach4, that's at C-O-A-C-H-F-O-R-E, and my podcast home is at 8laces.org forward slash podcast. That's 8laces, E-I-G-H-T-L-A-C-E-S, dot org forward slash podcast welcome to the coach's locker podcast with chris ford now let's get out hands 
Well, hey, again, we're speaking here today with head coach Masaki Matsumoto. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Coach Hoare. Uh, it's, it's an honor. It really is. Uh, I respect you as a man and uh, everything you do for the game and for the kids. So it, it really is an honor to be on here. Well, thank, thank you for that, Coach. We do something here to uh, introduce you to our listeners called the kickoff, the tip-off, and the first pitch kind of a play on words there on how games get started so coach uh we got seven questions i'm going to hit you up with and you can just kind of answer these briefly as we introduce you i know you're you're kind of twitter famous among uh among coaches on twitter but we got some who might not know much about you so just is just a way to introduce you out there to uh to the audience coach what's the first team you played on and what do you remember from that team specifically yeah um I, I don't remember the team's name, but it was actually soccer. Um, it was the first when I got to America. Um, I had been interested in soccer in Japan, but I was never on the team. And then when I first got here, um, my mom wouldn't let me play football um, until I got two years of like soccer experience, I guess. And so uh, that was my first experience. I think that was in uh, second grade. Um, and I remember I, I played goalie outstanding coach i was a goalie too we got something in common there exactly yeah so when did you move here from japan uh when i was um like in first grade okay. um yeah like 1991 maybe 90 i don't remember the exact year but um yeah so gotcha. was, uh, I, I came here with my mom um as she wanted to start a new life here awesome i know you you know you honor her quite a bit on uh on Twitter at different times of the year. That stuff's pretty neat to read, Coach. Thank you. Yeah, she's a special woman. Yeah. Very very brave. Uh, very, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm the man I am. Big part because of her. Yeah. Coach, how about the last team you played on? What what sports did you play, you know, growing up? And, and what's the last team you played on? What do you remember from that team? Yeah, so, um, you know, I thought I was going to the NBA when I was uh, in um, elementary school. Nice. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I played basketball a little bit. And then, uh, obviously, I joined football um, in third grade and, you know, really never stopped playing that. And then um, basketball kind of, kind of career kind of ended in uh, middle school when I started taking football a little more serious and I wasn't going to grow much, much more. <laughs> um and then I did track in high school just to get faster for football. And then I got an opportunity to go play at an NAIA school in Chicago, Trinity University. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so my last year, my senior year, it was actually, um, you know, I was projected to have a pretty good year. Uh, I played running back. And um, the first game, first handoff, I ruptured my quad. Oh. And uh, that was that was it for me. And so I was uh, I was a cheerleader on the sideline for the rest of the season. Coach, w w what was it like? So you got you're, you're with the, your mom, right? Single mom raising you here in, in America, uh, and you come home and tell you want to play football. These days, 2020, there aren't a lot of uh, you know more specifically single moms letting their kids play football. What was that conversation mm -hmm. like? Yeah, I, you know, I, I vaguely remember the conversation, but I mean, I she knew I loved football. You know, uh, I was exposed to it pretty uh, right away when when we moved here, and just really fell in love with it. And uh, but like I told you earlier, my mom, you know, she was worried, and so she said, "Well, you're gonna have to play soccer for at least a year or two, um, just to kind of, you know, get used to maybe the physicality and all that, you know, and." getting used to team setting. And so, yeah. um, so she, she, you know, she made me do that and I did, and, um, I was actually pretty decent at soccer. Um, but, uh, you know, after the year was up, I said, uh, can, can I play football now? And, uh, you know, I didn't have to do the second year of soccer. Uh, she, she let me play after the first year. So, oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, throughout my fo football career, she always told me she, you know, she was able to come to a lot of the games, which I appreciate. Um, but she, she said that she was always scared 
when when watching uh, when watching me play, uh, just because you know I was a, uh, at, at least junior high on, I was a running back and I would take some hits and uh, <laughs> yeah, she was she, she said she was always nervous while while watching. Where'd you go to high school? King's High School. It, it was, it's in uh, North Seattle. It's a it's a private school up north. Okay. All right. And then and then you go play at Trinity. Are you from there? Are you uh, have you connected with Coach Butler, the head coach out there, much? I'm not. I'm not. I I, I know there's been some coaching changes since uh you know the last couple of years, but um, I don't know. I, I kind of fo- I followed them on Twitter a little bit, and seems like they're you know they're trying to do some things. Yeah, I did. Uh, I interviewed Coach Butler every week for like a 15 to 20 minute segment on my podcast. Uh, let's see, 2018 season, his first season of being a head coach there. That was a pretty neat oh, way wow. to yeah, kind of document things. So those are back in the archive here. Uh, and I got a quarterback okay. quarterback of mine and, and uh, wide receiver that I coached in high school. And then the quarterback coach at our junior college here, he's out there playing for him now in Chicago and, and really loves it. So Oh, nice. Um, yeah, pretty, okay, yeah, I got to check that out. Yeah, Coach Butler's a great dude. Great, great dude. Coach, how about uh, who's been one of your main mentors in the coaching profession? Yeah, so I looked at the question, and um, I uh, I would say in terms of, like, head coach stuff, you know, um, how to run a program and, hey, you know, when you met, when you make a tough decision, what, what do you think about, et cetera, et cetera, um, I would say – uh, Tom Boehner, he's the uh, head football coach at Bothell High School. It's in North Seattle. And, um, you know, I, I, when I first became a head coach in 2012, I made a pact with myself that I would go visit successful programs and four coaches in the offseason. I would visit three of them. Um, and, you know, fortunately enough, I've been able to keep that uh, goal. And he was actually the first coach I visited when I made that pact with myself awesome. and then um defensively because I'm a defensive guy it's John Montali he's the defensive coordinator at uh Cathedral Catholic High School in San Diego and he um that's where I started coaching my or that's where I started my coaching career and just soaked everything up from him and you know even with now when I have uh questions I call him up and and he's always there for me yeah, we're going to get into your kind of your coaching career and track that in, in a few minutes. Uh, I'm intrigued yeah, to hear how. Yeah, how you. I always love hearing how guys got into the business. What What's the worst mistake you ever made as a coach? Do you think? You know, I I, I probably don't have one instance, but um, I would say the first year I got to Lincoln High School up here in Tacoma, Washington. Um, you know, I, I they had, and you know, we'll probably again get get into this a little more, but. Um, yeah, I just it was my it was my first school after Bernstein, you know, where where it all started for me, um, and I just felt like I could have done a lot a lot of things differently, you know, in terms of um, coming in there with with more of a solid foundation of who I am as a person, who I am as a coach, who what I want the program to exactly look like. Um, probably, you know, try to get the seniors on board more. You know, um, there's just a lot of things that I now looking back, you know, five years wiser and more experienced, um, I, I, I wish I could have done differently because even though we went 10 and one, um, that was, that was really the toughest season, uh, you know, of my coaching career, um, because I was basically replacing, uh, you know, a really good coach and a, uh, I don't know, uh, someone who turned it around and who played in the NFL, you know? And so, yeah. um, I, I think if I would have came in a little bit more prepared and, and obviously I was a little, you know, in, inexperienced, but I, I can't help that. But, um, I, 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 again, I just wish I could have done a lot of things differently, but I learned a lot for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that a little more coach. How about your greatest accomplishment as a coach? I would say it's all the messages I get from our former players. Um, that's, that thing brings me more joy. Um, and that, you know, voice in your head saying, Hey, you know, this is what you're supposed to be doing and this is how you're supposed to be doing it. Um, then when I get text messages and emails and Instagram message, whatever, whatever, you know, um, 
saying, hey, coach, I, I really appreciate what you've done for me or, you know, now I get what you were doing or, uh, you know, those types of messages. Yeah, those those are those are great, Coach. I, I love I love hearing from for, from uh, from former players, without a doubt. Uh, coach, your vacation favorite vacation spot. I think I might know it. I might know it. Is it? <laughs> does it start with an S? Yeah, you you you're pretty familiar with it, Coach. Yeah, yeah. So tell yeah, us your favorite vacation man. spot. Yeah, it's it's weird because you know I, I've I've I lived there for a few years, but uh, San Diego, California, it's. You just you can't beat it. The food, um, the the beaches and the weather, and you know it's not as crowded as LA, and um, you know you can kind of get to anywhere within 15 minutes. Um, I just I just love it. I I, I love it, and uh, I always call it heaven on earth. Coach, I love San Diego, man. I absolutely love it. I, I'm not. I'm living a couple hours north of there right now in the desert, but I really hope to get back to San Diego some point. I, I will get back there at some point in my in my lifetime. Here, we're definitely my okay. wife and I are definitely gonna retire back down that way. But you're right, yep. man. San Diego is uh, is a spot. It's just a great place to live. Um, yes, sir. So yeah, for right now, coach, for me, that's my. I was born and raised down there, but that's my favorite vacation spot too. Without yeah, a doubt, you can't beat it. No, you coach, can't beat it. your favorite thing to do outside of coaching? Yeah, uh, I think if anyone really knows me, um, it would say they would say uh, just going out to eat and and eating good food. <laughs> um, I just I, I love food, and you know behind. Uh, after ESK and I would say Food Channel and Travel Channel is probably my two favorite channels. And, nice. Uh, you know I love all the cooking shows and you know I try to cook my uh, you know myself and um, but yeah I mean there's nothing better than going to a, a nice steakhouse and you know hanging out with friends. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, traveling is I, I love traveling myself, man. I just wish I could do it do it a little more, Coach. Yeah, yeah, I know you're you're a busy guy, coach. <laughs> well, I, I think I think no matter how much you travel, you you'd probably always want to travel more. That's my guess. Um, mm. So, coach, let's get into kind of talking about your your career again. You know, we're going to spend a little bit talking about your career here. Then we're going to get into you know being a head coach. You had tweeted something at the end of last year, and I was like, man, I, I this would make a great topic. And so, uh, thanks for spending some time with us here because. A lot of guys, you know, my consulting business with the career aspect of things, um, a lot of guys want to be head coaches. I'm seeing a trend these days where we get guys coaching for two or three years who think, uh, you know, they're ready to be ready to be a head coach. And, and I don't blame those guys because I was the same way, you know, um, I, 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 so I don't know. It's kind of a interesting thing. We'll get into your tweet specifically in a few minutes, but how did you get into okay. coaching? How, where and and how did you start? You know, your career. You you played collegiately. Awesome. You're done with your college career. How do you get into coaching? Yeah. So right after college, I wanted to get my master's right away. Um, you know, I have heard from some people that were teachers because I got my undergrad in uh, physical education, and I knew I was going to be a teacher. Um, but people said, Hey, you should, you should try to get your master's right away. Um, you know, because a lot of people are doing it now when they have families and they're teaching and it's kind of tough. And so I, uh, applied at Point Loma Nazarene university, uh, in San Diego and Bril um, brilliant advice, by the way, to, to get that yeah. master's right away. Brilliant advice. Exactly. Exactly. I, 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 yeah, I, I thank God every day for it. Um, but yeah, so that's what brought me to San Diego in 2006. And uh, I started, you know, my grad school, uh, grad program. I got my master's and credential in special ed there. And so it was a two year program. And, um, you know, sometime in the summer, um, before, right before I was about to start uh, grad school uh, in that fall, someone asked me at church um, if I wanted to coach because she was the athletic trainer at Cathedral Catholic. Oh. And they were looking for it. Yeah. And they were looking for a JV coach. And, and she, you know, we were friends and she said, Hey, you know, you played college football. And so, you know, we could probably use your help. And so I knew that classes were at night and, um, you know, I had a part-time job, but I, I, I felt that I could make it work. So 
I, I was like, sure. Yeah. You know, uh, cause it's not something I thought I was going to do growing up. I, I knew I wanted to be a teacher, but I, I never, you know, I didn't, I wasn't super serious about coaching. And so, okay. but so that's and how let, I got let, into let me, it. And let, then, me, let me cut you off real quick, coach. For those who, yep. for those who don't know, uh, Cathedral Catholic in San Diego. I mean, Coach kind of hit the jackpot by this person asking him, "Hey, you want to come coach exactly. at my school? Because this isn't just some run-of-the-mill high school." Cathedral Catholic in San Diego. Um, well, it, it, put put it in perspective, Coach, was it this past season they beat uh, Centennial, right? Corona Centennial. Yeah. Yeah. So they did. Yes, yeah, sir. Cathedral Catholic, uh, a private school in San Diego who annually, at least the last, I'd say, dozen years at least, probably longer than that, is one of the mm-hmm. top three, two to three to four schools in San Diego County. And this past year beat Corona Centennial, who's, you know, Matt Logan, a stud. Corona Centennial yeah. is one of the best top two or three public schools in California every year, maybe four or five every year. So uh, yeah. Cathedral Catholic – it is again just wanted to paint that picture a little bit they usually have you know uh, one of the best coaching staffs in San Diego so you know you, you kind of mm-hmm. walked into a gold mine there right I really did again I, I I thank God all the time that that's where I got to start my career yeah. um, and so yeah I mean a lot of the success that I've had as a head coach I mean definitely comes from the, some of the things I learned there that's for sure so yeah, so the first year I was a running back, linebacker who, coach who for was, the JV program. Who was Coach Hamamoto there as the head coach at the time, or was it Doyle? No, she, yeah, Doyle had already taken over. Okay, all right. Yes, sir. Yeah, so he had been there for, uh, for I think you know at least five, eight years by then um, okay. as a head coach. Um, so yeah, but you know, but I didn't, I didn't really deal with the varsity team too much that first year. Um, but just really worked my butt off and I started loving the, the coaching aspect. And I surprisingly, I wasn't one of those guys who were, who was trying to like, you know, play through <laughs> the players because I missed playing. I, I, I actually uh, enjoyed coaching and just working with kids and um, bringing what I knew from, you know, um, my playing experience. And then after that first year, um, Coach Doyle asked me if I wanted to move up to the varsity because they needed a, a linebacker coach, um, and so I jumped on it. And uh, you know that that's that that's the, in the off season um, between those two years. That's when I just really got to know Coach Montali, the defensive coordinator, and I just I asked him if I could meet with them once a week for an hour and just learn the whole defense because you know I I knew I was going to do linebackers and I, I just wanted to know as much as possible. And, um, I, you know, he, he schooled me and, yeah. um, we had a great year. We, we won the CIF, uh, CIF championship. We beat uh, point Loma that year. And, nice. um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. And let, I let me think, stop you there. Coach. I, 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 yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm going to stop you a couple points here. Cause we want to use this as a, no some, good, some good, you got some good teaching tools here. After one year, you're asked to go up to the varsity. Yes, sir. Is, is that what you, Okay. So, and coach, I know you're a very humble man and I appreciate that. Okay. But I want you to talk a little bit about that because very rare are the guys who come in, coach one year high school football and especially, and I'm talking in a program like Cathedral in one year, you're asked, Hey, come up and coach varsity. I mean, that just doesn't happen. What is it that you think coach Doyle saw in you? Or what did you do in that one year to be asked to come coach at the varsity level at Cathedral? Yeah, I I just did everything they asked me to do, and I yeah. I served the program. You know, um, obviously I was there for all the practices and games. I came prepared. I mean, I was on the phone with uh, you know my friends who were already coaching linebackers uh, at the high school level, I was on the phone with them, you know, every weekend saying, Hey, what are some drills? Because I played outside backer in high school, you know, um, and I was coaching inside backer, So I didn't have a ton of experience with it. So, um, you know, um, so I just, I wanted, I didn't want to come to practice prepared. And, and they, I think they saw that, but the other thing too, uh, when I look back on it, um, they, they would ask me to go film games. Um, you know, film, film the next opponent and all that because Huddle wasn't really around then. And 
I, I said, yeah, sure. I, you know, and I just did everything they asked me to do, even if it wasn't quote unquote part of my job description. And, you know, they wanted to pay for my gas, but I said, no, you're, you're good. And, you know, I enjoy doing it. And so I just did, I tried to do everything, um, you know, uh, best as I could and, yeah. and put in the extra effort and, and even the things that maybe, you know, Oh, I'm too good for, or too big for, I, I, I didn't do that, you know? Yeah. And so I think that was a big part of it. And, and did you look for other things to do other ways to contribute outside of what they were asking you to do? Uh, you know what? No, they, they, they the, kept the you busy. Was just, yeah, they, <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they really did. They kept yeah. me busy and I kind of became the go, uh, every Friday night, right after your game, um, right after our JV game, go film. And I, that kind of became my regular thing. And, yeah. you know, um, and from just what I knew, I didn't know much then, uh, but I would try to take notes as well and, and, and try to give that to them, even though, you know, they probably didn't even look at it, you know, because they, they were going to break it down themselves. Yeah. But yeah. I think, again, they just saw that extra effort, you know, and so, something that sticks out to me. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, coach, it's like these I, I hate to sound old, man. I'm only 44, but these kids today coaching, you know, these the young guys coaching now. They have no idea how how amazing we have it with Huddle now, where you don't have to go drive to these games to film anymore. But I yeah. think they're missing such a big piece of that development as a coach in just doing those little things. I mean, sometimes that stuff just sucks. You go out Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, filming, taking notes during a game, you know, bringing that back, making the DVDs. I, I think that some of that work ethic now is missing a little bit, but it's not the fault of the guys coaching now, but I, yeah, I, I just, I would agree. yeah, I just, I think I see a little piece missing there. And then I was going to add, you know, like you, like you said, you said the perfect thing, you know, you did everything they asked you to do. And I would say if you're working in a program and you want to move up to that varsity level, um, coach, I was, I was doing that stuff at a school called Linfield Christian where I was, you know, I started there in 2001. My my head coach, a guy named Perry at the varsity, you know, I, I was like, hey, what needs to be done? You know, and and uh, yeah. I, I made a program. You know, we the, they, they didn't have a program at all. So I'm literally out there taking pictures, putting together kids' bios, coaches' bios. He's like, man, we haven't had one of these in a long – this is awesome. We haven't had these. I was doing laundry on the weekends. I mean, if you want to move up, do all that stuff nobody else is doing, you know. And yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the couple of things I wanted to add to that, and I also just you know, I guess out of humility and not and I understanding my place. Like I wasn't the guy first year, you know, bringing a bunch of suggestions and and th- and thinking that you know, like oh well, I play college ball and so I know this this you know, and I kind of just again kept my mouth shut and just did everything they asked me to do. And I think sometimes, of course, like you know, good head coaches will listen to you and, and want input. But I think some, some young coaches are too eager to be heard right away. Um, and I, I think still, like, you, you still have to kind of earn that, you know. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, Great it's not just a couple of weeks. Like, I think at least a season, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, but – and then the second thing was um, I remember when I was about to leave Cathedral, uh, you know, I had a good conversation with Coach Doyle just about life and – Coach Doyle said, um, he didn't know I was leaving yet, um, but he said to me, if John Montali, the DC left, you know, ever left, I would make you the DC, even though you've only coached a couple of years, um, because you, I know you'll do everything you can to, you know, get the job done. And so wow. again, that's, all, that's stuck with me as well in, in, and in terms of my work ethic, but also when I'm when I'm now hiring people, you know, like they don't necessarily have to know the most or have the most experience. If I know they're going to work their butts off and find an answer, no matter what, because they care about the kids, uh, that's who I'm going to go with, you know? So, yeah, that's a, that's a tremendous point, man. It, it's not who knows the most because shoot, you can know a whole lot about the wing tee, but if you're in, coaching in the spread, <laughs> I don't care what you know about that offense or that technique. If, if you're not willing to do the work, that's, very, very well said, Coach. Great point. Yes, sir. Thank and you. So, and so, yeah, so you leave Cathedral. What was the next stop after that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, find, I finished my uh, 
grad school program and I was ready to get a full-time teaching job. Um, but there was really nothing in San Diego, um, at the high school level, there were some elementary school, uh, you know, jobs and stuff, but I knew I wanted to, uh, be at the high school level and I still love Southern California. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to apply in LA as well. And, um, in 2008, Bernstein High School in Hollywood was opening, and uh, it was a brand new school, and it was opening, and uh, they had special ed positions, and so I applied because I knew it was a new school, and they would probably need coaches, and so um, I got the I got the teaching job, and they had already hired a head, a head football coach, so I came on as an assistant, but they didn't have a track coach, and I coached track at Cathedral as well, and so I became the head track coach. Um, of, of Bernstein and uh so you know being an assistant um at, uh, at Bernstein for four years we we went four and 36 um from 2008 to 2012 wow. and it, it, yeah it was it was tough um you know but I I love the kids and and I just you know um a- after the first year it was kind of apparent that you know hey he wasn't gonna really change his ways and he wasn't you know he wasn't really gonna delegate and so I just kind of like, like how we were talking about earlier, I just, I, I, I'm an assistant, so I'm going to serve him and just do everything he asked me to do and not complain and just, you know, do my part and, and love the kids. And, um, and, you know, it wasn't easy, but just kind of stuck it out because I love the track, you know, the track program and I like the teaching part and I like the school in general. So I just kind of stayed and, and like I said, did everything I could as an assistant and, um, after the fourth season, the principal approached me and said, hey, uh, we're going to let the coach go. Um, we love what you're doing with the uh, track program and, you know, you are you have a uh, good relationship with the kids. And so we were wondering if you wanted to take it over. Um, and I didn't know at that point if I was ready. Um, you know, it was my sixth year of coaching total. And uh, I just I knew you know, being a head football coach is a big deal and we weren't very good. Um, and you know, it was, it's an inner city school. So you're dealing with a lot of, you know, issues and, um, you know, and so I just didn't know I was ready. And yeah. so I asked, I asked uh, for the weekend to think about it. And that weekend I emailed coach Doyle and I just asked him, what, what do you think I should do? And, and he wrote me an email and, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, he, he said, you know, Masaki, I've never, obviously, I've never been in a, uh environment like yours. I've always been at uh, a cathedral. Um, but what I do know is this, whether you're at an inner city school or a private school, kids just want to be loved. And that just kind of, that kind of hit me. And I said, you know what, like, these kids deserve, you know, uh, love. And they, and I think I can provide that for them. And I can, I feel like I can, I will, I, I'm going to work hard for these guys. And so, when we came back to school on Monday, I, I accepted the job and, um, and we, yeah, for first, first season, we went eight and three and we, we kind of, we turned the program around pretty quick. And then, uh, the last two years I was there, I was there for three years as a head coach. Uh, we went, we made it to the, uh, semifinals and for, unfortunately we, we weren't able, able to make it to the, the, the championship game, but, um, yeah, we had a great run and, um, in 2015, after that third season, I had started thinking about moving back home because my mom's getting older and um, I just missed being home. And, yeah. and um, in January, uh, my high school head coach, who's still there now, emailed me an article about John Kitna, uh, how he was leaving Lincoln in Tacoma, which, which is his alma mater, uh, alma mater. You know, he took over the program after he retired from the Seahawks and kind of uh, revived the program um, there and but he was taking a big time job in Texas and so my my head coach from high school said hey this is the inner city school um, it's in pretty good hands now uh, he put a lot of money into it uh, I think you can excel here and I kind of, I read about the school a little bit and then that night I emailed the principal and then a couple of weeks later we had a Skype interview and I got the job and moved up here spring of 2015 and we just finished our fifth season. And, um, you know, uh, we had the best season this past season. We made it to the semifinals and 
lost to a really good school, Eastside Catholic, um, who who ended up winning it all. But wow. it's been it's been a great experience, and uh, yeah, I thank I thank God for for my journey for sure. Yeah, it's an awesome journey to hear about. So, Coach, when when do you think looking back to uh, to Helen Bernstein, when do you think you just, or, or, or maybe even back further out, when do you think you first said, "Man, I I think I might want to be a head coach someday." When do you think that first came into your your thinking? You know, I I think it first crept into my head sometime in those four years where where we went four and thirty six because <laughs> um, you know I was I, I I felt you know I had learned some good things at Cathedral and how to not just about the defense but just in general how to run a good program how to structure practice how to have coaches meeting because Doyle was, you know, really good about those things. Yeah. Um, and then I saw the things that, you know, you shouldn't do obviously. Um, and I just felt in my head, like, I, you know, especially, uh, you know, I'm not going to obviously at that point go take a survey job, but I think sure. I can maybe handle a school like Bernstein, you know, uh, a, a, a newer school uh, where there's really, you can only go up. And so I was, I was, you know, that, that did cross my mind for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, coach shoot, we talked about, you know, cathedral, the, the power that they are. I mean, you go from there. I coach, I've been in Southern California all my life. I never heard of Helen Bernstein high school until yeah. I had a friend reach out to me. We're going to get in this in a few minutes too, but a friend reached out to me. Hey, you got to go check out ESPN right now. Check out this high school in Southern California. They're on there right now with this pretty dynamic coach. And, and again, we'll get into that in a few minutes, but I turn it on, I see Helen Burns, I'm like Googling it. What? Where is this high school? You know? <laughs> so you go from yeah, you go from one of the top, you know, private schools in Southern California to uh, basically an unknown public school. I'm sure and I, I don't want to say too many negative things, and I know you don't either, but I'm sure that was a frustrating, you know, four years, four and thirty six. I'm sure that was frustrating. And and it makes sense that you were thinking like gosh, maybe I should be a head coach one day, you know, if, if this is a type of program that kids are, you know, being exposed to. And so you guys go four and 36 in four years. Did, did you say eight wins in your first season? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, that you talk about a turnaround. Uh, what, what were two or three of those reasons you think that thing got turned around so quickly under your leadership? Well, we, we did have some good players, um, you know, I, and I, I knew that uh, they just obviously weren't able to be used to the, the, the you know, fullest because just, again, um, the way program was ran. But so I, I would never take that away. You know, play, players are on the field and, and you can't really win without some Joes. Um, so that's one. But number two, um, we in, instilled a, a discipline and, um, you know, we, uh, made it fun and we, we provided structure and, and so, I mean, just typical things that, you know, uh, I'm sure you, I mean, you already know, but, um, you know, it sounds kind of cliche, but those were some of the things that we, we, we provided. Yeah. I was going to say, coach, that structure was probably a real, real important piece of that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't very structured before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so we get back to this tweet, Coach. December 20th, 2019, last December, you put out this tweet <laughs> that really got my attention. It said, Coaches, before applying for a head football position, be sure you're willing to work year-round for three months of pay. <laughs> awesome. Check grades, run study hall, train the team year-round, hold players and coaches accountable, Work with parents, take the blame for all the bad, be first to serve and last to be served. Again, I, I read that tweet, man. I read it like five times and I'm like, man, this is so right on, so honest, so transparent. And I think it's why we see, you know, here in Southern California, we the last five years I've been tracking every head football coach change and it's it's about you know, 18 to 20 percent changeover every year. Uh, Florida, a contact I have out there, Florida HS uh, Football, I think, is a Twitter handle. He's been tracking. It's about 20 percent there. Flor uh, Texas is about the same. 
There, theirs is actually a little lower, but I think that's one reason we see the head football coaching turnover, specifically in California. Get a lot of guys in there that don't really know what it takes. So I love the honesty. So many guys, you know, really want to be a head coach, but I don't think they've really counted the cost, so to speak. Why did what prompted you, if you remember? Why why did you tweet that out? That sentiment. Do you remember? Yeah. Um, well, we had just finished a long season, um, you know, uh, and in, in a good way, but obviously, um, you're worn out. And I was just reflecting that day of man, like all the things that we've done and it's going to start in about a month again. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, and, yeah. and in my, in my head, I'm like, man, this is crazy. And it was also the time, you know, all, pretty much the football season was over in high school. And I just thought like, oh, we're going to have, you know, people trying to apply for jobs. Maybe they're not ready for it. And, or they don't know what they're really getting into Again, if you want to do it right, you know, many people yeah. can get be a head coach, but um, you, you, you know, you're not going to have much success if you're not willing to do it right. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's really the combination of those two, um, knowing that it was going to be application season and then just reflecting back on the season that we just had and just going all the way back to January and realizing we're about to start in a month. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a. I hate to use the word out there, but it's so popular on social media, but it really can be a grind, you know, especially like you said, when you've had that success, you know, you're playing into December and gosh, all of a sudden it's Christmas and now we're back for the new year and we better get started. Um, yeah, w without <laughs> yeah. a doubt. So coach, take us through kind of your 12 months. Um, you mentioned, you know, working year round for that three month stipend, right? Uh, yep. what, what do you do in, in January when you come back from the holidays, what does yeah. your 12 month season look like? Yeah. So, uh, well, we, you know, we start pretty much in December too, uh, you know, with our exit interviews. So we'll exit the interview, uh, you know, returning players, seniors, and then uh, the coaches just to get a good feel and it gives me a good idea and a pulse with the team see who, what coaches are coming back, et cetera. And then we have our, you know, uh, new season team meeting, I guess, for all interested in football right before we leave uh, for Christmas break, just so over break, uh, the kids can talk to their families and start planning for rides and stuff like that for our morning workouts. Um, so we already start that in December. And so, and then when we come back in January, we have a coaches meeting and I know that's probably weird for you know some coaches but um we are that january meeting is just as big as the the meeting right before spring ball you know as a staff because that's when we plan our uh morning workouts that we go from january to june and we you know ask coaches to sign up for you know certain days and uh, we have about you know, thank God, uh, six, about five to six coaches every morning at those morning workouts at 545. So, wow. you know, it takes a lot. It, yeah, it takes a lot of planning. And so we do that. And then obviously we plan out, plan the workouts and plan who's going to be where, et cetera. And that's when I also, uh, on, on the computer, create a football class. Um, I turn in a roster to the office lady because, and this is important because that's how I am able to run uh, their grades um, every Monday. And then, like I said, the, um, and then start planning for clinics, right? And, and, and my, you know, my three visits as a head coach. Um, and then obviously January, that's when college coaches are flooding uh, the, the campus, getting ready for a signing day and all that. So that was, that's January. Um, and then February, I'll start looking for coaches and interview coaches um, just because I know by then uh, I know who's leaving and what we need. And then I will put together our spring and summer schedule and make a calendar and, and start, you know, um, planning all that and, and, and put it on a hard copy. And then I'll start planning our spring fundraiser because we always do a fundraiser in spring and then uh, beginning of the season. And then, uh, then we start we start uh, planning booster stuff like booster meetings and with our president and and then um, you know see see what our needs are in terms of that. And then that's when we also start doing uh, you know weekly uh, grade checks. And then March, 
we start planning for our uh, competition that we do in the morning. Um, that's how we kind of um, finish off our morning workouts in April and May. Um, and so there's a lot of planning that goes into that competition um, in terms of like picking captains and figuring out logistics and all that. And then we'll start meeting with the new coaches to get them up to speed on our scheme and technique and all that stuff. And then um, I have to do equipment and uniform, uh, you know, inventory so I, I can start ordering stuff um, so that they'll be ready um, on, on time for spring football. Because in Washington, uh, we can go full pads uh, during start from spring ball on. Um, now you get limited days, you get 20 days of it, but, um, you know, so we have to have all the helmets ordered, shoulder pads ordered, all that by, um, end of May. So I start in March looking at what we need to order and, you know, what we need to throw out, et cetera. And then, you know, kids favorite, uh, I have to start preparing the spirit wear and spirit pack and set up our online store. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some, but that's kind of my, uh, January, February, March. Now it, it does sound like a lot, but I would still say that's probably the three lightest three months of my, my, my year. So coach, when you, you decide, you, you talked earlier about going to see three schools. Do you do that instead of going to like clinics or do you do no, both? I, uh, yeah, we, I, I do both. Yeah. The, okay. the clinic, the, cl the clinic, um, I like to go as a staff. You know, it's a good way to make sure our coaches are getting better. And then, you know, we go out to dinner together and just to kind of bond. Um, but the other, the actual visits that I privately um, set up, you know, myself, and sometimes, uh, you know, an assistant coach has gone with me. Uh, um, that's something I do separate. Gotcha. No, that's smart to do. Smart to do. Love that. Um I know I was just talking to a coach yesterday morning who was going to fly out to a college with his a couple guys from his staff this nice. week, and, you know, they weren't able to because of the coronavirus and everything happening. Yeah. So, all right, so then that exactly. takes us, I think, into uh, April. Yeah, and then April, it's just, you know, finishing out, finishing out the, like, the morning workouts and just really putting my focus in that because we do a really cool thing where, you know um, – 16 captains, two captains per team. Um, they, they draft their team for the morning workouts and everything is based on competition. And so, you know, attendance and um, the activities in the gym, it's, it's one team versus another. Um, GPAs, uh, you know, uh, GPA, uh, if, they, if a kid gets in trouble in class, uh, that team loses points. Uh, they could do service hours where they go help teachers or go do community service and they, they get points. So that's a lot of work for me uh, because I have to always, you know, collect things and add, uh, add points and all that. So that, that takes a lot of my attention uh, for April and May, but obviously also mid May or mid April to June, uh, we start meeting as a staff once a week to get ready for spring ball. So that's probably our main focus, um, for April and May, getting ready for uh, finishing out the morning workouts and the competition and getting ready for uh, spring football. And coach, uh, how many days are you guys allowed up there uh, in, in full pads? Uh, we get 20 days of football from uh, late May till uh, end, of August, uh, end of July. Sorry. So basically, yeah, two, two months, you get 20 days to do football stuff and what's the rules how 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 long a day or like how, how many hours per day uh, are you allowed in in pads uh i mean there's no like time limit i mean you can't like do two a days you know maybe teams do but uh i mean just the regular practice you know two two and a half three hours and yeah and we're we're in pads and then so you know uh the big thing up here in the spring is team you know uh teams go to scrimmages and team camps where they full on scrimmage other teams. Wow. Yeah. Totally different than a lot of, yeah. a lot of other States. Yeah. Totally different. Yeah. All right. And then that, that kind of takes us into the season. We don't need to get into that too much, but I, I'm always intrigued to hear about, you know, what, what happens there during, during the off season coach, how do you hold kids? One of the things your tweet said, checking grades, running study hall. How do you go about uh, holding your kids accountable in the classroom? Yeah, so 
you can't hold them accountable if you don't see them, right? Absolutely. And, and so um, in Washington, we're not allowed to have a uh, athletic period. That's just, it's, it's, I don't know, it's not allowed because I guess, I don't know, for the reason you're excluding people or whatever. Um, so the only option we have is to go in the morning. And that's why our morning workout is so big because um, that, that there's multiple uh, positives. But one of the big ones for me is that I get to see our athletes, you know, for the whole year. And I remember Bob Latterster said one time, um, you don't teach accountability by giving players January to June off. <laughs> right. Wow. And so uh, that, that, that January to June period is so huge for us because even if they're playing other sports, like if their coaches aren't, you know, being tough on them and checking on them and checking their grades, like they can just fall through the cracks. And so I just feel better, like, you know, them being with me and, and me, me being able to see them in the morning. And so I can check in on them. So, um, first, you know, for, for the first couple months, uh, I just talk to them, you know, if they have low grades, I'll, I'll just pull them out to the side and say, Hey, da, 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 da. And if they're like a, you know, a college prospect, I'll, I'll just always drive that, you know, Hey, you can't go to college with these grades. Let's get them up and whatever you need, let me know. Um, but when we get to April, when we get to that competition part, uh, April and May, they actually have to do something, uh, which is called Abe uh, Boot Camp. Or so we're the Lincoln Abe's. That's our mascot. So it's called Abe Boot Camp. And any kids who have an F or two Ds, they have to do hour and a half of tutoring at least. And um, they have to carry a, like the slip throughout the week. And anytime they go to tutoring by a teacher, uh, they get it signed and once it gets to at least hour and a half, then they're supposed to turn it into me by that Friday, um, two 30. And if they don't, then on Monday, they'll have consequences, but also their team loses points for not turning in the flip. So that's, that's worked out well for us. Have you documented coach, like what effect, you know, your, your system there has had on GPA, like GPA was here when I got here and we've raised it to this much over the last four years. I have not, but I have not, but what, what we do take big pride in is a lot of, a lot of kids because of the, a lot of people, because of the school we're at, um, they think that we always have, you know, five weekers and ineligible kids, you know, when we start the season, but if they are coming to our morning workouts, they, they, they're not ineligible. And, um, the only, in the last few years, the only kids who start the season, um, you know, ineligible are like kids who transfer in with bad grades, you know, from a, a, from another school or some kid that just completely never came to morning workout and just decided, you know, in August to come out and usually those kids are ineligible. So, um, the, it, it, this system has worked and, and um, it's, it's something that we take great pride in. Yeah, that's awesome. Coach, how do you find, you know, there is so much to do. We've been talking about it as a head coach. How as a head coach, do you find that work life balance? You know, do you, are, yeah. are you able to, are you able to unplug or able to have any kind of off season as a head coach? Yeah. You know, I, uh, I've gotten better about that. I think in the last few years, um, because when you're young, you just, you know, you, you don't listen to anyone and you feel like you can just go nonstop for 50 years. But in the last few years, um, I, I have, you know, I feel like I've done a better job of delegating, uh, to our assistants and making sure, um, you know, I, I go on a vacation during the summer and spring break. Um, and like I told you that, that January, February, March, it is a little bit more on the lighter side. So I, I try to take advantage of that and, you know, hang out with friends on the weekend and, and, um, you know, try to, try to do stuff. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not perfect at it. And I think, you know, if I was married and had kids, I probably would be better at it, uh, about it because I, you know, I would be forced to, um, because I would want to be a good husband and father, but, um, because I am single, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I probably do. Um, I probably don't do this, um, the best I can. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense for, yeah, you're right. I mean, when, when you get home as a, 
as a married guy or, you know, uh, or even if, you know, some, some coaches out there might be living with a family member or something like that, you got someone else there and, you know, you do, you've got some other priorities kind of forces you to, to, you know, put that phone down and, and play with your kids or help your wife cook dinner or whatever it is. But yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if, if, if you are single, you don't, you know, you might not have that. Um, it, it is a tough balance, you know, and, and I know that that, that definitely, you know, burns some guys. I mean, how, how do you, how do you treat your staff during the weekend, the week coach, the game week so that, so that they can find that work life balance? What kind of, you know, staff meetings, what's your weekend look like? Yeah, uh, actually our weekends. Now we're going to change it a little bit this year, this coming year. Uh, but, um, like defensive staff, we came in on Saturdays and game planned and offense. They kind of just did it from home. Uh, they would communicate on emails and phone. And, and then on Sunday, I would finish up the game plan for defense and our OC would finish up his game plan at home um, on, on Sunday as well. But we never met on, we, we never meet on Sundays and every year I struggle with that. Um, but I feel like, um, you know, we have some, uh, we have some men of faith and including myself and um, you know, so I, I don't want to bring them in on Sundays just because of church and family time. And so I try to be, um, but it is a battle, you know, I'm like every year, Oh, maybe, maybe I should do this. Maybe we should come in on Sunday, but um, I, I feel like giving them that Sunday off is important. Yeah, no, Absolutely. Coach, how do you get along with parents? That was another thing you tweeted. You know, you, you talked about uh, working with parents. You kept it really nice working with parents. How, how do you get along with parents? And, and kind of what's your honest, philosophy? To be, yeah, to be honest with you, Coach, um, last, I would say, two, three years, it's it's been great. Like, we don't get any complaints. And, um, yeah, it's just nothing but supportive and um Luckily, there's a there's a track between the stands and the sideline, so you know, and I have my headset on, so I don't get to hear too many complaints. Um, but you know, in honest, in all honesty, um, it's it's been fine. So I think a couple of things that that's helped me with this, um, because first couple of years I did run into a lot of you know parents who had issues or who wanted to complain to me about playing time, etc. Um, especially again, you know, coming after Kitna. Uh, I, I, I'd, prob- I'd probably couldn't please anyone, you know, yeah. uh, but uh, that during those two uh, years, I, I, again, reached out to, you know, coach Doyle, um, who, who's been awesome to me um, and kind of sought advice about that. And he said, Zaki, no matter what they're complaining about or how unreasonable they sound or how narrow sided they seem, just remember that their kid is the most important thing in the world to them. And so that kind of gave me a perspective like, okay, you know, if I had a son, maybe I would be thinking this way too, you know? So I try to really um, understand where they're coming from and always keep in the back of my mind that, you know, no matter how much of a team player they want to be, their son's going to always come first and they're the most important. And so, you know, I, I, I hear them out and then I try to, you know, be respectful. And uh, even if, you know, I think they're totally being unreasonable. I, I try to really give them that respect. Um, but with that, I also uh, have a parent meeting, um, you know, um, unfortunately the attendance isn't great. It gets better every year, which is awesome. Um, just, we just don't have a ton of uh, involved parents at Lincoln, but uh, that meeting gone. That meeting really helps. Uh, we have that right before spring uh, spring football starts, and I just go over all the rules in terms of you know, hey, like you know, players play, coaches coach, and parents support. You know, and I just kind of set that guideline, and uh, you know, I t- I tell them that three things we won't d- discuss are uh, you know, uh, football decisions, uh, play calling, and we c- we can talk about playing time, but um, we would, we have to, you know, the kid has to be there as well. And so I just, I, I've, I've been kind of, you know, I, I made these boundaries and protocols and, you know, uh, we can meet for this, but we can't meet about this. And I made it very clear. And I think that's helped a, a lot as well, but, you know, we've been pretty successful on the field and I think the parents appreciate 
all the work that we do with the, the, their kids, you know, um, not just football wise, but character wise and, you know, and just uh, serving them all year round. I, I think all combination of all that has um, helped with just me not having to deal with any bad parents the last few years. Coach, I think if, you know, one thing I've seen as an athletic administrator, six years doing that in, in the different programs under me, if coaches only care about the wins and losses, only care about the stuff on the field, uh, and the kid is, they a, a parent feels like their kid is getting screwed playing time wise, they're going to be a lot quicker to complain than the mm-hmm. coaches and programs where they're doing a lot for that child. Like what you just described, coach, I've seen that phone calls and emails to me, the AD, you know, we've had some coaches who do just a dynamite job off the field, developing people. I never hear about playing time. You're, you're so right about that. If you're servicing these kids in all these areas and the parents know that you really care and love their kids they're not going to question you about playing time. And I think that's something real important for some of the younger guys listening, younger coaches listening. But if it's if you're all about the field and you're not doing anything off the field to help their kid, then guess what? You're going to deal with on the field problems. So I think you've, exactly. uh, you know, yeah, you you figure that out. And I love what you said about meeting with, uh, you know, if they want to, if they wanted me to talk about playing time, the kid has got to be there. That's a policy I had as well for eight years as a head coach yeah. because I am not going to talk about playing time unless your kid is there too. And uh, because, Coach, you and I both know nine out of ten times, that kid knows why he ain't starting. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, kid knows exactly. exactly why. And I had a dad. I've shared it a few times either in an article or on here. You know, I had a, two different dads, ref, you know, demand, 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 demand to meet with me, say, no, I'm not going to bring my kid to the meeting. And so I took them on the field. I said, if you're not going to bring the kid here, then we're going to meet on the practice field and you're going to watch your kid with me. And in both times, oh, wow. those, yeah, in both times, coach, those meetings were less than two minutes. So <laughs> one of, I'm not lying. I'm not making stuff up here. One of those times is a quarterback, a sophomore quarterback. Okay. Dad played college, was a quarterback. Dad coached him all his life. He gets to high school. Dad's not coaching him. Dad thinks he's the best quarterback since, you know, Peyton Manning. And uh, and but the kid just he he had so much pressure from his dad to be a great quarterback. He could not mm. think and just play. And we ran the wing T. And it, this kid would pull out and reverse pivot the wrong way ninety percent of the time. And I mean, it, I'm not kidding. It was awful. And so I said, I'm just going to, we're going to run your son through five plays here. And I would, and I worked it out with the head JV coach. Okay. And I gave him a f- script. Here's our first five plays so that the dad would be standing right next to me. I'd say, okay, this is, you know, this play, he should roll out that a reverse pivot on this foot. going to hand the ball off here. The kid went the wrong way, coach, three out of those five times. And I said to the dad, <laughs> Hey, all, I'm gonna, all we're going to do, we're just going to watch. I don't want you to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. All I'm going to tell you is which way he's supposed to go, and then we'll evaluate it after that. Well, first two plays, kid goes reverse pivots, comes out of center the wrong way. Okay, and Dad's getting pissed. Third time he does it right. Fourth time he does it right. Fifth time he screws it up again. And then I said, sir, your son just uh, – reversed out of being under the center, took the snap and went the wrong way three out of five times. Do you understand now why he's not starting? And he goes, Mr. Four, you you will not hear from me again. Thank you very much. Wow. Shook, my, shook my hand. We never heard from that guy the rest of the season. And then he transferred his kid out to another school in the area after that year. But uh, And then the other one was a linebacker who I took uh, who had a – a great kid, and he was a great special teams kid because he gave a thousand percent, but he could not read guards or backs at all. And um, boy, ju- and just not a very smart kid to be honest with you. And I brought dad yeah. out, did the same thing, stood down in the end zone. We had a little linebacker drill. We watched five plays. Here's what your son should be doing, and then we saw it. And I think it was three or four again, three or four times. Kid went the wrong way, made the wrong read. 
And, you know, again, we never heard from that dad again. So, but I, mm-hmm. I think, uh, smart of you not to talk about PT unless, uh, the kids there coach you're coming up on an hour, a few more questions here. One of the things you said there was, um, I quote you, you said, take the blame for all the bad. What do you mean by this? Is this a deliberate philosophy that you lead with or, was that kind of said tongue in cheek, kind of smart alecky? What do you mean by that? Take the blame for all the bad. Yeah, I, I think if you are the head person of anything, it's it's your fault when you know anything goes bad because that's something that you know whether it's something you should have fixed. Well, you're going to fix now, you know. And um, I just don't believe in. Um, blaming the people under you now you're going to hold them accountable and and you're going to address it but that's taking the blame right because if you aren't taking the blame you're not going to go address it with that person and say hey we got to fix this and how can i help you right you're going to just say oh well that was your fault you need to fix it you know and so um i always tell our players uh if we if we win like you're going to get the credit and i'm going to praise you like crazy on the newspaper if we lose I'm going to take all the blame to the newspaper. And I, and I, I, I truly, I'm kind of wired that way. Like I know there's something I could have done. Like that's what I always think first. Um, and uh, I think any leaders need to take that approach. Otherwise you're just going to play the blame game and people are going to be mad and nothing's going to get fixed because it's always someone else's fault. Love it. And was that something you learned from somebody along the way or just kind of part of who you are as a leader? I think, I think that's part of who I am. I think there's some, you know, it's just, it's just ingrained in me. I don't know how, but there's something that I could have done, you know, that I always think about that. And, yeah. um, yeah. Probably so, your mom coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was, honestly, she was, she, she, yeah, she was tough on me. Yeah. Coach, you said this again, I think it's just part of who you are, but you said, uh, you know, you sure you really want to be a head coach. You got to be the first to serve the last to be served. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's it's not about you. It's it's really not. And I, again, I think a lot of people, you know, go for the job because oh, because of the title, or because you're you get to call the shots and or whatever, or it's a stepping stone. Um, but it's it's really not about you. It's it's about serving the kids first, and whatever your needs are, you know, uh, that has to be kind of pushed it aside, right? Uh, one of my mentors, he said, um, being selfless isn't thinking about your, it isn't th- not thinking about yourself because that's impossible, right? But it's thinking about yourself less. And I, I think you just, you have to constantly do that and, if, you know, and, and remind yourself, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not if I look good. It's not if I get the credit. It's not, you know, if this is going to help my career, like it's about helping the kids. But the thing is, Coach Coach Four, and I think you would agree, when you when you have that mentality, like blessings just come, you know. At least in my experience, like when you put others first and just you're all about helping other people um, without even asking for it or expecting it, blessings come your way. And and I've I've been a uh, participant of that because because of this mentality that I've had and I've tried to coach with, um, you know, I get asked to come on podcasts or I get, I get asked to go speak at AFCA, you know, and, um, I, I get, I get freaking put on a TV show. Like I, it's, it's crazy when you really do, you know, put others first, like you, you do also get blessed. And I think that's how God works. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. No, biblical principle Jesus shared and, and, and led the way with that for sure. And coach that, that brings me into my next question here. We got two more questions for you. Um, yes, again, I, I first learned about you watching ESPN. It was a, pro, a program on E60 called Letterman. Uh, you were the head coach, again, at Helen Bernstein down here in Los Angeles. Uh, not many listening to this podcast has prob- have probably ever heard of that high school. Okay, um, uh, And then it ends up on ESPN. So tell us about uh, – first thing I want you to tell us, why was that show called Letterman? Tell us what you do with letters. In It's not a football letter, not something goes on a letterman jacket. A written letter, typed letter. Tell us what you do with letters in your program because 
It is so unique. And then do you know where coaches might be able to go watch it? Is it online? Um, it isn't. So uh, the person that produced it gave me the uh, the link to the video and the password. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, but uh, I don't know, for copyright reasons or whatever, but I'd be more than happy to share it with you and you can figure out a way to, I guess, show it or or – you know, get, have, give access if you want, coach. We could talk about that after. Okay. All right. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, coach, what, yeah. Uh, what What is that about? Yeah. So, uh, again, I got the idea because I go visit coaches, and um, I, I mentioned earlier my mentor in terms of head, being a head coach is Tom Boehner up at Bothell, and it's he's the first guy I visited, um, and he he told me about something you know about what he does and it was something similar and I thought it was awesome but then on the drive home I I thought man how because Bothell is a pretty affluent school um how how powerful would it be at a school like ours where you know our moms are probably working three jobs and they probably don't really see each other and you know love probably isn't expressed much um and so I just I fell fell in love with the idea, and so what I did was I typed out a letter to the parents, asking them to write their son basically a love letter, why they love him and why they're proud of him. And I asked the Spanish teacher at Bernstein to type one in Spanish as well. And we, you know, uh, we folded it up with a blank sheet of paper and put it in an envelope and sealed it and give it to all our players in our program and ask them to bring it back by a certain date. And this was, you know, uh, leading into the uh, summer football. Well, I collected all of them. And after about two weeks later, after one of the summer workouts, uh, I gathered them in the gym and I said, Hey, remember those envelopes you brought back to me? Well, there were letters written by your parents. Cause I asked the parents to like, you know, kind of keep it a secret um, and just, Seal, seal it back up without you know showing the kids and and i said hey next 20 minutes you're gonna spread around spread around uh this gem and go read this letter privately to yourself and i i handed the letters back to everyone and they found a quiet spot by themselves and uh, i don't know it's crazy like five ten minutes into it i i heard a bunch of kids crying and sniffling and uh shedding tears and amazing um, yeah it was amazing and after that, I brought the team back on the bleachers and I said, hey, like, if you don't believe your love now, like you, you should now, you know, and you're, all, you're also loved by this program. You're also loved by us. And so basically my whole thing was like, you have no excuse not to do well, because a lot of times I think kids don't do well because they don't feel loved or valued, you know. And so that's why they go join gangs or they find pleasure in drugs or, you know, they drop out because they just don't feel like their lives matter. And so. Um, that's the main point I wanted to just drive home with them that they are cared for, even if it's just a single mom, you are cared for. And so I wanted to kind of give them that affirmation and, um, yeah, as it was a powerful, uh, you know, uh, activity. And, um, after that, I just kind of gave a, uh, open mic to the kids and kids came up one by one, just kind of shared what was on their heart. And it was a really good bonding experience as well. Uh, I'm sure that was powerful. And so how many coach have you done this every year now as a head coach? You know, that's, it's funny. I have not coach. I have not done it. Well, it's, uh, it's hard to replicate that, that, that authenticity, right? Yeah. It, it really is. So, you know, I've been thinking about doing it maybe in the next, you know, year or two, uh, just because it's been a while and I feel like it will be authentic um, and powerful. Um, have you done but, it up there in yeah. Tacoma? We haven't. No, okay. We not. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, it was amazing. And the great thing is like when we would have back to school nights or, you know, parent conference, some parents would come up to me and said, thank you for what you did. Like that, that wow. helped our relationship. And so it was, you know, obviously helped the kids, but it also helped the, the parents and just bring them closer together. So it was, it was amazing. And, um, just to kind of add on, uh, so we did that, um, that activity and, uh, the summer going into my second year as a head coach, right. Cause we had turned the program around real fast and Eric Sondheimer of the LA times, 
he called me going that summer going into my second year uh and just said hey like what's what's with the turnaround like what are you doing different and you know and i think he was he was expecting maybe like oh well we run the scheme or we got transfers or whatever you know and i just said you know what like discipline and we we got the kids to kind of care about each other and play for each other and he said well what are some of the things that you're doing to do that and i just gave him an example of some of the things we do and the letter was one of them and he just kind of like fell in love with it and that's when he wrote the the front page article of the on the la times and then a year later espn like i don't know probably saw the article and picked it up and called me out of nowhere and said hey uh you know we we read the school article and we want to follow your team for a, a whole season and so they followed uh our uh our season um that that last season i was there I didn't know they followed you guys all year. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Wow, <laughs> they they were they're really good about you know staying out of the way and but uh, yeah, uh, they're there for everything that 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 third third and final season. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, coach. I think that's man. That's a tremendous idea. I I had uh, we we do a three day camp like when I was a head coach. We do a camp in our gym, you know, to kind of kick off training camp and. And one of yeah. those years I brought, I just had this idea to have like a father son pancake breakfast one morning. And then I gave, uh, I gave each father and son a little script of like seven questions to break off and, and go through. And man, I had, I had dads like coming up to me, giving me a big hug afterwards saying like, thank you. I haven't had like one-on-one -on -one time like this with my son in years, you know, and that, that kind of made me sad in some in some aspects that they hadn't had that, but yeah. but man, yeah. what what you did for those parents and kids, I'm sure there were things parents wrote in those letters. Coach, did you hear like the kids hadn't heard those things ever said by their parents or not in a long time? Yeah, one kid came, you know, when when they were sharing in front of the the, the team, the open mic, uh, so to speak. One kid. There were a couple of powerful ones. Uh, one kid said, "I didn't know my dad loved me oh, <laughs> until this gosh. letter." Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, another kid. Yeah, another kid shared a story. Like um, he he said that he would, when his mom was at work, when he was little, he would wait on the front porch until she came home because she, he wanted to make sure that she didn't leave him like his dad did. You know. So. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of pain in these kids' lives, and um, you know, I think more they can be transparent about it, and at, you know, and ask for help. Um, the more successful they can be, and I always, I always say to people that you know, I don't think you can truly care about someone unless you know their pain, and um, this was a great way for people to share their pain, and because you know, once you know their pain, you you have some empathy for them, and now you're going to fight for them, you know? Wow. And so whether That's it's powerful, in football yeah. or just in, yeah, whether it's in football or, or just relationship, I think it's important to be transparent and vulnerable. And, you know, we always tell our kids, if you can't cry in front of your teammates, then this team's not the right one for you, you know, because we want our kids to be able to share about, it, you know, uh, each other and, and be transparent. And again, most importantly, ask for help, you know? Coach, man, this has been amazing. Coaches, if uh, if you're out there looking for a place to go, you know, Coach talked about going to visit three programs a year. Um, you need to get up and spend some time here uh, up in Washington with Coach Matsumoto because I think he's he's had some great success. We talked a little bit about that turnaround. And I, I really think, you know, if you were to ask him what's led to this success, it's what we ended this podcast talking about right there, loving your players, loving these kids, giving them something to play for and hope for. Uh, you, need to, you need to reach out to Coach. Coach, tell us what your Twitter handle is and how, how people can, uh, can reach you. Yeah, uh, Twitter handle is at Coach Matsumoto. And my email is m.matsumoto20 at gmail.com and I take great pride in writing everyone back and, and emailing them stuff uh, just because I've had so much help along the way. And so please uh, feel free to reach out to me, DM me, whatever you, whatever they need.
Coach, again, man, I really appreciate you spending so much time with us, and thank you for uh, for being a mentor to others now. And, uh, again, thanks for coming on the Coach's Locker podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you for everything you do.